All right, we are recording now. Welcome everyone to the Protocol Labs Research Seminar Series. Thanks for joining us and a special thanks to those of you not with PL. It's really great to have you here and welcome to those watching the recording at home. Reminder that if you want to be informed of future seminars or stay up to speed on what we're doing at Protocol Labs Research, you can visit research.protocol.ai, drop your email address in the footer to sign up for announcements and quarter new quarterly newsletters. You can also find a playlist of previous seminars, including Bernardo's talk from last week on TARDIS and craft. Uh, you can find those on either directly through YouTube search, or you can go to our outreach page on our website and scroll down to public talks. And then you'll also find other ways to connect with what we're doing on that outreach page of our website, including funding opportunities and, uh, and other things. Okay, so today's speaker is Bernardo David. He is an associate professor at the IT University of Copenhagen, and he'll be talking to us about the albatross randomness beacon. So go ahead and take it away, Bernardo. Well, thanks for the invitation. Thanks everyone for watching. So today I'll talk about this recent work together with Nacho Cascudo from India Software Institute, which is on publicly verifiable secret sharing and applications to randomness beacons on public ledgers. So the agenda is basically an introduction to what publicly verifiable secret sharing is and how I can use it to build beacons. And hopefully you can get an idea of why this is, inter this is an interesting thing to construct. Then uh, a brief introduction to our contributions as well. Then I'll go over to a brief explanation about our PECT uh, PVSS scheme and our basic albatross beacon and an idea of how we do the universally composable versions of albatross, finishing with some considerations about future works. And let's start with the remnant beacon introduction. So as you can see, these slides are very uh, Japanese. That's from uh, when we first presented the first work we did on this um, line of work of randomness beacons in uh, ACNS 2017. And basically what you want to construct here is a protocol that periodically gives you a fresh random value. So this protocol we, will act as a central beacon that generates some random value and sends it to all participants in a way that all participants can be convinced that this was indeed uh, the correctly generated value. And because it's correctly generated, it is uh, random. And this beacon will generate these new values periodically and uh, make them available to all of the parties. Now, why are we even interested in building this uh, kind of protocol? First of all, because we don't have the nice Tokyo Tower there giving us the randomness. And even if we did, we wouldn't want to trust a central authority to generate randomness for us, especially in the context of permissionless systems. You actually have things such as the NIST beacon that they promise that generates random values from quantum physical processes and so on, but when the whole goal of a cryptographic protocol is not to trust anyone, you would like to do the same without trusting other people. And if you can do so, you have a number of applications such as online lotteries and gambling as the most uh, interesting, more fun one, let's say, but much more interesting things such as generating randomness for things such as smart contracts and for leader election in consensus protocols. This has also been shown to be useful for things as diverse as anonymous communication and election protocols in the sense of uh, electing politicians, not leader elections, and uh, a multitude of applications where you would like to have a random value that is agreed upon by a number of parties and such that you can be convinced that the value was correctly and randomly generated. Now, how can we attempt to build such a protocol that generates these random values without trusting a central third party. The basic idea 
goes back to to the 80s to the time of uh, the beginning of modern cryptography when uh, bloom suggested the simple bloom coin tossing idea where you can have a bunch of parties talking to each other let's say in this case that they have actually a public bulletin board not just direct channels between each other or a uh, broadcast channel and they have the ability to locally generate some random values, commit to these random values, meaning that they basically put them in these commitments that act as lockboxes, such that when you post a commitment, no information about the random value is revealed to the other parties. And later on, they can open the lockboxes in such a way that whatever was in there is revealed to all the other parties with the guarantee that this value has not been modified at the time of opening. This very simple idea gives us the guarantees that if at least one of these values uh, are random, then we can obtain a random output because it basically XOR them all together. The mechanics of this uh, idea is that if you cannot modify this random value that you put inside your lockbox after seeing the other party's um, random values, you cannot bias the final output of the protocol. So you do obtain uh, with 100% probability a perfectly uniformly random value as long as one of the parties, let's say yourself, are honest. However, this is only true if those parties agree to perform this protocol, to execute this protocol to the end. We could have the following situation where an adversarial party does not open its commitment. In this case, we cannot compute the final output because we don't have that party's um, random input. And then you might ask, but why can't I just use R1 and R3, the random inputs that were open in order to compute something that's gonna be uh, uniformly random because we know that, that at least one of them comes from an honest party. Well. Uh, the problem is that this adversary can always bias the output we would observe because it knows the values of R1 and R3 before it chooses to not open its commitment. So it knows, for example, let's say that its random value on the first bit is equal to one, so that if it reveals its random value, it's going to flip the output of its XOR. But if it doesn't, the output is just going to be equal to R1 XOR R3 in the first bit. So at least on one bit, or rather on the bits where this uh, adversarial random input that is, can even be not random are equal to one, the adversary will be able to bias the output. The problem gets much worse when we actually have multiple adversaries and they could be committing, for example, to strings where each position of the string is equal to one for one of the adversaries, for the adversary, adversarially corrupted parties, but not the other positions. So they can exactly choose what's going to be the output of the coin toss in here without having to, to by simply choosing whether they open the commitments or not. Now, some way you could try to do this is by constructing what we would call a GOD, coin tossing which means guaranteed output delivery, meaning that no matter what the adversary does, we should be able to reconstruct its input and finalize this protocol execution. The way we would do it is that apart from committing to these random inputs, we would also secret share those random inputs into the secret shares that alone do not really review any information about the, the input, but when combined can be used to reconstruct these inputs. We could use the so-called publicly verifiable secret sharing schemes introduced by Stadler and uh, later improved by Schoenmakers to generate the shares in an encrypted way, but where we can still check that they are valid. And then let's say when we open these commitments, if some people do not open their commitments, we can actually reconstruct their inputs from the shares and finalize our protocol. However, we're still in trouble if we don't use it and actually publicly verifiable secret sharing. 
if we just use a very simple idea with just a regular secret sharing scheme or even a verifiable secret sharing scheme where you can publicly prove that shares are valid because this uh, adversary could actually be posting invalid shares and then not opening its commitment which would make it impossible for the owner's parties to retrieve the adversary's input and finish the coin tossing protocol. So if we want to construct this sort of publicly verifiable guaranteed output delivery coin tossing, what we need is what we call a publicly verifiable secret sharing scheme where we can share a secret, post its shares in an encrypted form, but still prove to all of the other participants who have access to these encrypted shares that they are indeed valid shares that can be for sure reconstructed to a valid secret. And by doing that, now we take the adversary's power of basically sharing random, uh, no, well, we're sharing random things anyway, but by sharing its input in an invalid way and then not opening the commitment and either aborting our protocol, forcing us to abort or introducing some bias into our coin tossing. This uh, basic idea for uh, random beacons within the, con the context of public, of uh, blockchains, permissionless blockchains has been introduced in uh, the Uroboros paper by myself, Agnus Kayas and Alex Russell and Roman Unikov back in 2000. 1718, and then improved by myself and Nacho with a better PVSS scheme. However, we're still left with a scheme that would let us only generate one value at a time, one random output at a time. I'll talk more about that later, but before I'd like to introduce what our main contributions are towards building better beacons of the form I have just shown you. First of all, we introduce a PVSS scheme that has the currently best amortized complexity in the following sense. First, we can share vectors of random inputs instead of single random inputs. So we go from this uh, very small amount of randomness that we can share to a lot of randomness while keeping our communication complexity basically the same as in the previous case where we could only share one uh, random uh, element. We can extract a lot of randomness by combining several random vectors shared by these parties, even though some of them might be slightly biased. We can still combine all of them and use randomness extraction techniques to in the end obtain a big matrix of random elements that we can use for all of our randomness needs instead of obtaining just one single element. And we also optimize the share validity checks that you have to do on top of these encrypted shares to make sure that you actually have valid shares of your inputs. So this table I'm, I'm copying and pasting here from our paper basically shows you how we improve the state of the art in relation to what is actually our previous work called Scrape. We go from a random output size that was one single random element to an output size that is of the order of number of parties squared. So here, this n is the number of parties. And our amortized complexity in the worst case is still log of n modular exponentiations. Whereas Scrape's amortized complexity was always n, uh, in the order of n squared modular exponentiations. However, in the best case, if people behave nicely in our protocol, we actually get amortized complexity of the order of a constant, which is pretty nice because uh, now we can still generate this huge amount of randomness with very little work, as opposed to generating one uh, random value as in scrape and always having to go through this uh, n squared complexity. And in here, we're basically looking at the PVSS complexity. But I guess you can see that by jumping from an amortized complexity of, uh, of the order of n squared to an amortized complexity of the order of log n, we have a huge improvement in efficiency 
in Albatross in comparison to Scrape. Apart from that, we solve another important problem, which is that both Scrape and these previous approaches to remnant as beacons based on publicly verifiable secret sharing were proven only in the standalone case or sequential composability case. We couldn't prove that they could be used as a black box into more complex protocols without extra work of reproving that these protocols are secure if we use these approaches. In order to do that, we need to have a protocol that has composability guarantees, meaning that it retains its security guarantees even when executed in parallel with other protocols or other instances of itself. We solved this problem also in Albatross by presenting a UC treatment of randomness beacons, which we define formally as publicly verifiable guaranteed output delivery coin tossing functionalities. You can look at the paper for the exact definition here. I'm not going to go over these details in the talk, but we also present two matching constructions, which are first one based on UC non-interactives or knowledge proofs, which work better if you do single shot executions of our protocol. And another construction based on UC homomorphic commitments that work better, it works better if you do large batches of executions of our protocol. So if you, apart from needing one big matrix of randomness, you need several of those big matrices of randomness, you can use our UC um, construction based on these homomorphic commitments that have nice amortization as well in order to generate an even larger amount of randomness with UC security. This solves this important problem of having a, a black box building block that you can just plug into protocols that need this kind of randomness beacons, such as proof of stake based protocols for blockchains or election protocols or any other application you might have. Also for um, cer certain specific purpose MPC protocols where you would like to have a random beacon to help you do committee election and so on. Now, if you compare this uh, beacon reconstruct here with previous works, you basically have the following. The previous PVSS based beacons, such as our scrape paper, require in the best case, this order of uh, n squared exponentiations per random output, while we require in the worst case, uh, log of n. Then the VRF-based beacons are extremely efficient. They're used in uh, the, uh, uh, the state-of-the-art proof-of-stake-based blockchain protocols, such as Uroboros Praos, Genesis, and Algorand, Thunderell, and so on, have biased outputs, meaning that an adversary can always in insert or introduce some bias on the output. You will not get a uniformly random output, as we get with our beacons, even though they're quite efficient but still they will give you one output, not a big matrix of, of random outputs. Then you have this uh, newest constructions of uh, randomness beacons based on timing assumptions, such as time lock puzzles. But even though we can prove they are secure, they rely on very finicky timing assumptions and assumptions on secure computation that are not well understood at all. We can do a theoretical analysis of these and prove that under certain theoretical conditions, this will output a random value that is uniformly random and so on. However, no one knows what the concrete details for these schemes are. No one knows how to compute the delays of this, uh, this co the computational delays that are involved in this timing-based beacons. So I would say it would be extremely hard to deploy one of these schemes right now with proper security in the real world. And then there's also a lot of um, a lot of talk about oh actually not verifiable random function I had that in my head when I wrote the slides read it verifiable delay functions sorry the, the beacons based on verifiable delay functions also rely on timing assumptions that nobody understands and uh, in that case it's even worse because they're they're basically a folklore result with no proof nobody ever wrote a full proof that a verifiable delay function based beacon will output a random value under whatever theoretical condition even. There's no uh, proper definition of composable 
um, verifiable delay functions either. That's something we're working on, as I mentioned in the previous uh, talk last week about TARDIS and CRAFT. So basically we depart from this uh, situation where either we have this seemingly efficient versions uh, of randomness beacons with timing assumptions that no one knows how to instantiate, or we have easily biasable beacons based on verifiable, uh, verifiable random functions, or we have beacons that give us uniformly random outputs, but where we have to pay a very high price to generate only one random output. And we go to this setting where we have a very nice amortized complexity for all the randomness we are generating. So basically the way we do it is that instead of doing the publicly verifiable secret sharing as we did before in Scrape, for example, we depart from that and build instead a packed verifiable secret sharing. It means that instead of sharing only one element with our secret sharing scheme, we can actually share a vector while using basically the same amount of communication. As I'm going to show you, the thresholds of corruption we can tolerate will be not as high, but from that we'll get a lot of efficiency. Our setup in the beginning is basically having a public bulletin board that you could try to realize, for example, using a blockchain or a Byzantine agreement protocol. And we assume that in the beginning of the protocol, the parties have already registered a number of public keys on that bulletin board. And we will use this public keys to do a sort of a public key encryption of shares. We start this uh, pack publicly verifiable uh, secret sharing scheme by doing a packed Shamir sharing of a vector of shares. I'm skipping a detail here that actually we share things that are on the exponent of a generator of a cyclic group, but well, let's say we could even turn it into sharing of an arbitrary vector, but we are basically gonna use packed Shamir sharing to generate from your shares of this vector that is L elements long. So our L here is going to be related to the number of parties N and our threshold T in the sense that the number L of elements we can share is equal basically to N minus 2T for the setting we're in. And that our sharing polynomial here will be a polynomial of degree at most T plus L minus 1. So in order to generate the, um, generate the shares, actually I should have put a minus sign here, it would be P of minus uh, one to minus L. This is a, a typo. And we would obtain these shares and then encrypt them as basically raising the public keys. There are also group elements to each share and generate non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs of share validity. These non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs basically show that these ciphertexts, the dark squares here, contain shares where that were computed from a polynomial P of X that has degree at most T plus L minus one. Again, sorry for the typo here, it should be T P minus one to P minus L, but you get the gist. And in order to verify that these shares are valid, we basically have to verify these NISCs. So once we publish both these ciphertexts and these NISCs that we can generate in a pretty efficient way, we have a concrete uh, NISC protocol in the paper that generates this with very few exponentiations and uh, very few uh, group elements. We just verify that the shares are valid by verifying that these NISCs are valid. This is a bit easier than we did before with straight. So this gives us some improved uh, complexity. And in order to reconstruct, we publish a decryption of uh, the shares that we, we received as honest parties together with another NISC that shows that this is a correct decryption, uh, meaning that the, the plain text share or pulsing was actually obtained by decrypting the ciphertext that was published in the bulletin board before. Now all the parties can verify this proofs of decryption correctness. And if they are correct, they can obtain the 
long vectors from the decrypted shares, the vectors of a uh, length L. So this is what we can do in order to share and then uh, verify in public and reconstruct in, with public verification a vector of L elements. And the nice thing we can do is then use the fact that we can do this sharing of vectors instead of single elements to do a beacon similar to what we have done before, but where we can generate multiple random outputs instead of only one random output that is computed as the XOR of these uh, random inputs that were shared before. So the idea is like in the previous idea that I showed you with the GOD coin tossing for random beacons, where you generate some random vector with L elements, you share it using the RPVSS scheme and you publish the encrypted shares on a public voting board. All parties verify those, those, those shares and discard the parties with invalid shares. Then the honest parties or N minus T parties really will, uh, where T is our threshold, right? Will our corruption threshold, will reconstruct all the vectors that remained in the, in the bulletin board or N minus T vectors. And from those um, L squared uh, values, we will extract L squared uniformly random outputs. So I skipped a lot of details here, actually doing this verification and reconstruction of the shares efficiently doesn't mean simply repeating several instances of our protocol naively. We went through to great lengths in showing in the paper how you can actually amortize the, sh the share verification and reconstruction in case you're running several instances of this protocol in parallel by coordinating the work done by different subsets of parties in this. So that's what gives us our nice amortized complexity. And in the end, we can get this L squared uniformly random outputs. Now this still is standalone construction based basically. So from this, we would like to get still our uh, UC versions. And these UC versions can be either NISC based as I said before, or UC commitment based. In the NISC based version, Apart from the encrypted share, we will add an equivocal commitment to the shares. So an equivocal commitment is basically a, a commitment that allows uh, someone who has a special trap or a simulator to open the commitment to any value. For example, you could be doing that with a Peterson commitment. It's one of, I would say, the most uh, well-known equivocal commitment scheme or uh, with DiCrescenzo, Ishai, Ostrovsky, or your favorite flavor of uh, equivocal commitment. Now, since we also publish an equivocal commitment apart from the encryption of the shares, we will need to prove that both the encrypted shares contain are actually valid shares, that the ciphertext contain shares generated in the correct way, and that the equivocal commitments contain the same messages as our ciphertexts. If we go for a Peterson commitment in the implementation of the equivocal commitment, we can actually do this proofs using efficient zero knowledge persistence for discrete log relations. Of course, we still need to compile them into universally composable non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, which will require us to use some techniques based on CRSs and global random oracles. But still, even though this has an overhead, it's still not doing a generic zero knowledge proof over a circuit or something like that. This is more efficient than that. The point here in adding this equivocal commitment is that when we're simulating that in the UC proof, we can use the following trick. When we need to extract what an adversary gives us as shares, we know that they're correct by the NISC, we know that, it's, uh, that the shares are valid, but we're gonna need to extract them so we can extract the adversary's random vector and send it to a functionality that embodies this random beacon. And we can do that by extracting the shares from the NISC using it as a proof of knowledge. So we actually need a NISC proof of knowledge which can be done uh, using, for example, the um, framework by Kamenich and all from Asia Crypt 11 to 
generate these NISCs together with other frameworks that will allow us to turn those real knowledge proofs into NISCs. Then when we need to do the other side of the simulation, where we need to lie to the parties as a simulator, show to force them to obtain a specific random matrix that we obtained from the functionality, then we can lie to them by equivocating the opening of these commitments, opening our ciphertext arbitrarily, but then using the zero knowledge property of those NISCs to trick everyone into thinking that we actually had the shares inside these uh, commitments and inside this uh, ciphertext that would yield the arbitrary result that we want the simulation to obtain. So it, with a simple modification, we can actually get a, a UC version based on NISCs. Now, the NISCs still require an overhead in order to, it, using the NISCs require an overhead because we need to instantiate these UC NISCs that it's usually not a very cheap thing. So we have another version based on commitments where we use the following blueprint. We commit to the shares using efficient, non-interactive, you see, additively homomorphic commitments. So instead of encrypting them, instead of encrypting those packed Shamir shares, we put them in these commitments. We use a trick from our scrape paper to check if those shares are valid. This trick will need some random dual code words, but we can generate them using fit Shamir style techniques by hashing all the previous transcript as the person generating the share. And what we do, because we want this all to be non-interactive, is that we publish encrypted openings to these commitments using a publicly verifiable public key encryption scheme on the public bulletin board. After we do that, all of the other parties can locally check that all of the shares are valid by looking at this, this great trick that we did over this, um, this relatively homomorphic commitments. We can do that using just linear combinations. They see that we indeed post the commitments to valid shares, and then they can publicly verifiably review their shares because they can extract this opening from their ciphertext using their, their secret keys. And they can prove to everyone that these openings that they're posting on the public bulletin board are exactly what the, the dealer of the secret sharing scheme gave them inside the ciphertexts. And the fact that these openings are valid can be verified by the fact that the original scheme is a commitment scheme, obviously. Now, this is interesting because this commitment scheme that we use is uh, very good for large batches of commitments. So we could be running using, using this one of these uh, commitments. We could be running several instances of our PV SAS scheme. So we could include inside each commitment several shares for several instances of our, of our PVSS scheme. And then the parties would obtain, in the end, not only one um, matrix of random elements, but several matrices of it random elements with a very nice amortization in the complexity of the, of the commitment scheme. This commitment scheme can actually be instantiated only from uh, pseudo-random functions and hash functions. So it's extremely cheap. And we add the public encryption aspects here, this building block, but we can instantiate that also from the CDH assumption and glo a global random oracle. So we think that this is actually an interesting technique that you can put something inside a commitment and then delegate the opening of that commitment to a third party who can later prove that that was a valid opening or not. So we actually define this new notion of designated verifier commitments. And we realize them combining these commitments uh, from Azure Crypt 11 last year by me, Nacho and a bunch of other people with some tools from uh, for publicly verifiable public encryption from uh, last year, this year by myself, Kasten Baum and Raphael Dowsley. So we actually define this as a standalone primitive, this designated verifier commitments. And we hope that there are more uses for that apart from building PVSS schemes. But the reason is that in the end we get this nice, um, this nice batching 
And also interestingly, because we can realize all of this, all of these uh, building blocks in this construction, only from the CDH assumption and the PRG and the hash function or the global random oracle, it's actually the first uh, PVSS scheme that doesn't rely on the DDH assumption. Because the previous schemes the, for PVSS and for uh, PVSS-based randomness beacons, even though they use the random oracle, they still rely on the DDH assumption, the decision of Diffie-Hellman, which is stronger than the computation Diffie-Hellman assumption. And now for the first time, we get both a, a scheme that is universally composable and it can be based on weaker assumptions than the previous schemes that were not uh, universally composable. So this is an interesting uh, outcome actually from using this uh, commitment-based approach. Now some uh, future works on this that I think are of interest, especially given recent results on proactive secret sharing on blockchain systems is that we could try to do this, this publicly verifiable secret sharing with the efficiency we have, but in a way that we can actually share towards parties whose identity we don't know. Here we assume that we know these public keys are connected to the parties specifically so we know how to, uh, how to who is receiving each share. In uh, this current line of work by uh, Tara Bin and others and uh, Vipul Goya and others, people have been creating schemes where, where you can public, not really focusing on public verifiability, but in, in the sense that you can keep resharing and refreshing the shares to new sets of parties based on them holding a witness for a relation or an NP relation or some other condition that doesn't involve knowing their identity. So it would be a very interesting thing to actually extend our results with something, some property like that, some proactivity and resharing. Another interesting thing that's actually connected to the context of the project funded by Protocol Labs where I did this uh, research is that using these long vectors of randomness and also this idea of being able to share towards parties that we don't know whose identity we don't know, we could also use this to do secret single leader election where each uh, randomness value would, in, in our big matrix, would identify one specific leader in an, in an anonymous way and where each of these anonymous leaders would be able to generate shares that in the end result in more matrices of random values towards anonymous people who will come after them. So this could be used in this context as well. Well, thanks for uh, attending the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have now. Feel free to just jump right in if you do have questions. I can't see everyone's hand. And uh, if you don't feel like being on the recording, you're welcome to just type a question into the chat and I'll read it out. Hey, Bernardo, I have a question. Hey, Rene. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, maybe I miss it. <laughs> so maybe it's my fault. But I remember that when you get, were giving the table about the complexity for this protocol for Albatross, you had the, the average case and the worst case, I think. Yeah. Worst case and best case, actually. Uh, yeah, what, what's the difference? Maybe you said it before and I missed it. In that case, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, that, that wasn't very clear. So we have this clever way to distribute computation between the parties. Okay. By basically subdividing them into committees and having them do certain operations that we need to do for the reconstruction. And if they all play, play along well, we don't need to, we get this uh, basically constant amortized complexity. However, we still want to recover the values and finish the protocol, even if this, some of these committees of parties don't play along well. In that case, we'll have the log n amortized complexity. So, so it's, it's actually nice that you have this uh, optimistic approach, right? That if people play along well, this should be the computation very nice. If not, we can still deal with it, but it's gonna have so a high I complexity. Mean, the, the, the complexity comes from the, the fact that you need to reconstruct um, the secrets um, 
giving the shares. And then, and then the basically what you are doing is um, uh, Lagrange interpolation in in the exponent of uh, of the group because basically you um, well your your shares are are uh, some generator of the group uh, raised to 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 the Shamir shares, right? And then you need to reconstruct all the secrets, and uh, and that is quite costly uh, actually. Uh, so. So we have been implementing this um, with with uh, Eva, uh, who's here also, and it's uh, by far uh, reconstructing the secrets uh, is the most uh, uh, costly part, most expensive part. But if everyone plays well, so if the dealers uh, basically uh, open the the secrets that they have shared, they they can just uh, do that by announcing the secrets, and then and then it's much easier. To verify that that uh, these secrets are correct, that they are the, the right uh, secrets that were uh, shared, than than reconstructing the, the secrets when when the dealer is not collaborating. So, so it, does it depend on who is participating in the computation for the reconstruction? Basically, are you saying that? Uh, yeah, so so basically, what I'm I'm saying is that uh, if the dealer uh, reconstructs uh, himself and proves. I mean, he doesn't even need to prove, but he reconstructs the values that, that he was uh, sharing. Then it's very easy for the other parties to verify that actually they were the correct uh, mm. values. So then the dealer just announces, okay, so I actually had secrets shared this value. Well, if he doesn't, because this uh, it disappears from the computation, you still need to, re to reconstruct the, the, the secrets because otherwise there are all these problems that Bernardo mentioned at the beginning, where you don't open the commitments, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and, and and so, if the if the dealer suddenly disappears from this this computation, then uh, then the other parties need to reconstruct the secrets, and that is uh, since they don't know these exponents, this this uh, uh, Shamir secrets, then then it's, it's, it it is much more costly to do that. The interesting thing here is that because we have this, but, this uh, up. Sorry. Yeah, yes, so sorry, just another, uh, another, mm, let me say something here. But like, I can, I can, I like, as an adversary, I can force the protocol to be in the worst case, right? Yes. You can, you can. So it's not an average case or, okay. No, it's, okay, it's not in that sense. Uh, it's, it is just, uh, I mean, I think it's important to say that if uh, if everyone is being honest, then the the complexity of the protocol is actually much better. Okay, I see. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah, I mean, if everyone is being honest, everything gets better in this protocol. The good thing is uh, that you yeah, could you can nice. look at this uh, optimistic approach with a fallback to the worst case from a financial incentives point of view, using this idea of uh, financially punishing people who misbehave, for example. So it's this case where the, 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 it's a, almost like a, a Trump adversary. It's going to pay for the work you have to do in order to recover from the worst case. The adversary can force you into the worst case, but it's going to lose some collateral that will pay for your extra computation time. So you can do that. Uh, and you are always ensured to get um, uniformly random values. There's no weird timing assumption no condition, no VRF bias that g comes into this, uh, th this protocol. But so can't, an adversary, a can't an adversary just DOS the dealer? Yeah, that's what I said. You can just be the dealer and yeah. participate as a dealer. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. I think. You no, but right, what if you are not the dealer and you DOS the dealer? That's what oh. I'm saying. What do you mean? You go in the worst no. case, complex. I don't, mean, I don't understand you DOS the dealer. Right. So you are not the dealer, but you DOS the dealer. And you don't, I think you don't pay any penalty in this case, right? Why, should, why would you pay the penalty if you DOS somebody else? Somebody else is paying the penalty, you are not paying the penalty, and uh, the protocol is, is basically running in the worst case. Ah, I if see what I you mean. did not lose anything. I, I see what you mean. If you, if you go to the, yeah, of course, the, there's real world concerns to that, but uh, you, you can always uh, the DDoS any, any, any part in any of these protocols, then you would need somehow to distinguish between a failure and a corruption, which we know to be impossible from distributed systems literature. But assuming that people have proper connections and they're not being DOS, you could do approaches like that. Um, 
but that, that's the, that's the, the reason well, why you have then, best and worst I, case. I, well, one thing that that I wanted to add because this this worst case is actually um, not only if if just one party uh, uh, one one party acting as a dealer uh, uh, disappears, but actually you would need like uh, uh, many of them uh, to get this complexity. Basically, O of n parties. So uh, each of the parties in the protocol is acting as a dealer of uh, of one secret and uh, or one vector of secrets. Uh, so you would need that actually O n of them uh, asymptotically. I mean, or, or you know, a fraction of them actually uh, play dishonestly in this way. So you would actually, in, in other words, if, if you think of what Lucas said, uh, then you would need to let be um, so losing actually O of O of N, o -N uh, uh, dealers. What's, what's the constant there? The threshold, the, recon the reconstruction threshold. What the, so um, uh, of N, there's this, like uh, one third uh, of. N one third and uh, is the number oh, uh, yeah let me go to the slide also so yeah basically we uh, we can get any uh, um um one minus epsilon uh, times one half uh, of n but yeah. uh, we are thinking uh, usually of one third yeah of the parties for the one third case then you get very nice uh, very nice parameters throughout like you yeah. get a lot of randomness with uh, not too much work you could you could go to to one, one half, but then you can only you go back to the case of getting one element basically. So that, that you have to be in a in a nice range there. You have some wiggle room, but if you get if you want to tolerate too much corruption, you degrade back to the case where you're you're only generating very few elements. So you're in that you're wiggle room there. The I think especially interesting in in, in protocols like Algiot and uh, other BFT based protocols where you're dealing with the one third corruption threshold anyway. So if you run that with the one third corruption uh, threshold, you start getting <laughs> all the all the nice constants there appearing in this protocol. Any more questions? Can I ask another one or? Of course. Some... <laughs> no, I was asking if there is someone else with the question and leave the floor. Okay, I'll go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned when you were doing the, v the UC versions, you have two UC ver versions, one yeah. using the, the, the non-zero knowledge, one using commitments, yeah. and the commitments one was more efficient, right? Yeah. Can you do the same trick uh, with for the non uc version, the basic one, removing the NISC, even if it's not like a super expensive part, maybe can you remove it and do something with an extra commitment there? I, I don't really know. don't see how to do that uh, without a no malleable uh, additively homomorphic commitment. Okay. If it's not no malleable, I think there's a lot of very easy attacks that you could throw at it. Like very, very okay, easy so thanks to bias easy. the randomness and all. So I didn't even consider uh, the point of using the UC commitments there is exactly because you get the no malleability. And then, I mean, with our scheme from, from Azure Crypt, right? Uh, we, we have this, uh, this very nice non-interactivity with, uh, with PHMIR and it's no malleable. So you can do the, this, uh, the, this trick from, from Scrape to check that the sharing of, or sharings are correct with this, uh, this, this linear function on the commitments or, and on the shares inside the commitments and the dealer who generates the commitments can also feature mirror this uh, linear this linear combination of, of uh, commitments and shares inside and open it. So it can open the, the, the result of the test in public. It can designate it verifiably open the individual shares towards each party. And then the no malleability of the commitment scheme makes sure that there's nothing you can do to, to break the scheme. I mean, I thought, ah, maybe you could use, let's say, a, a piercing commitment and do something with that. But uh, all the, 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 the possibilities I could think of, you would end up with something that's malleable that then maybe you could even prove that's a, that, that's a secret sharing scheme, but then you could do weird malleability attacks to break the beacon. So it seems hard. 
I mean, of course, I mean, you know those commitments very well. So, you know, <laughs> you were one of the authors. So, <laughs> you know that there's some overhead in, in, in making them, but you get the OC security and because they work very well for long vectors, we can do all this PVSS instances at, uh, at once and do several matrices. So th that was one of the motivations. And I think it's interesting that we can get everything from, uh, with that version, we can get uh, an instantiation based on CDH that we could not get for the other versions, uh, even using a random oracle. Any other questions? Okay, well, great. Thank you so much, Bernardo. And for those watching the recording who might not realize, uh, Ignacio is a co-author on the Albatross paper. So when you saw him, um, jumping in to answer some questions as well. That's that's the context for that. But thank you so much and uh, hope to continue this conversation into the future.